All right. So, uh, ladies, gentlemen, we are going to be starting the class of Danielle. This is, I think, what is it, class number four or five? I lost count. Um, but I know where we are. We're in chapter uh, three. And um, you know, there used to be a time where uh, if there was a State of the Union address by the President of the United States, people would be interested in what he has to say. Perhaps we need to reschedule the class to another night. I guess times have changed. Um, not much competition. Uh, not much, co much competition there. Uh, but nevertheless, I will try to make the class interesting and enjoyable. Um, I hope you enjoy the class. We, we have some papers there which um, the young man is now collating and he will distribute them soon. While he is collating those pages, I will tell you what's going on because we're actually in the middle of chapter three. So I want to describe to you what is happening. Okay, um, so you remember that Nebuchadnezzar has a nightmare. The nightmare haunts him, it terrifies him, and the reason Nebuchadnezzar is haunted by the nightmare is because he understands what it means. In the dream he sees a colossal idol uh, made out of gold, silver, uh, copper, iron, and clay, and he sees the entire thing crashes down. There's a small stone that comes out of a mountain, and the stone hits the idol in the weak spot, and it crashes down, and everything is decimated. So Nebuchadnezzar understands what this means. Uh, Daniel confirms his worst fears. And do you remember the meaning of the dream? It means that the empire that Nebuchadnezzar put in place, right, the capturing of other nations, the subjugation of different people, conquering the world, that system will eventually collapse. Right? So that's the dream, nightmare. That's what concerns Nebuchadnezzar. And this happens before he actually establishes his empire. So well, the story that we've begun to read last time takes place after he established the empire, right? He conquered Jerusalem, he conquered many nations, the Persian nation, the Median nation, all, and he has a huge swath of land and many people that he controls. And he's thinking about the stream. And he's thinking, what can I do to prevent that nightmare from actually taking place. What is it that I can put in place? So he begins to think about this deeply. And he comes up with a, I would say, a brilliant answer. He creates an idol not made out of gold, silver, copper, or iron, clay. He creates an idol, actually an obelisk, right? A huge obelisk made out of pure gold. Remember that? And what does he do? Nebuchadnezzar, did the, we got the pagers? Everybody got, yes, okay. Nebuchadnezzar, I, 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 um, I have the pagers, yes, that's, that's what's important. So he, he, he creates this great obelisk made out of pure gold. He gathers all of the government dignitaries, the judges, the magistrates, the police officers, the heads of the army, the, the governors. He brings everybody to Bikatu uh, Dura, that's a place in Babylonia, a huge plain where the obelisk is in the middle, and he has a symphony, beautiful music, right? The Babylonian Symphony Orchestra playing some German, uh, some German music, maybe, I don't know, what were they playing? Uh, Wagner, they're playing Wagner, beautiful, everybody's very cultured, very well-dressed, and what is the purpose? The purpose is that at the moment that the maestro, the uh, conductor, signals to the people through the music, they are all going to bow down to the idol, right? Now, do you see how this is the antidote to the dream? What happens in the dream? In the dream, um, there is uh, disunification. There is dissonance between the different metals, right? Gold, silver, copper, iron, clay. And that dissonance creates disunity. And the disunity eventually leads to the fragmentation of the empire. So what's the antidote? The antidote is pure, single substance, the best substance, gold, 
and everybody together, all the nations, all the ethnic groups, all the languages, they're all different people, but they're all unified together in the worship of the obelisk. You understand? So you see there's a dream and there's the antidote. The antidote, complete unity. Everybody together bows down. Everybody is submissive. And you know, you may laugh at this and you may say, what a bunch of dopes, you know, bam, really? I'm saying bam, it's in Hebrew. <laughs> really, everybody's bowing down before an idol. I mean, how silly, how infantile. Don't you have any self-respect? <laughs> but it happens all the time. It's very rare to find a generation where people are not submissive to a particular government norm or a particular ideology, and everybody bows down indiscriminately to whatever that ideology happens to be at the time. Perhaps we'll talk a little more about that, but I just wanted to point out that this isn't just a bunch of primitive country bumpkins. We're talking about the Western world today. This is the way people are. People are submissive to authority. No one, or very few, I don't want to say no one, few are the people who want to use their minds and exercise critical judgment Few are the people who will stand up and say, this is just a gold obelisk, I'm not going to pray to it. But there were those people, and you know who they were. Because in the crowd are Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, the three Jews. They're the ones who say, well, you know, with all due respect to everybody, to the Babylonians, to Nebuchadnezzar, to the magistrate, with all due respect and consideration, we are not going to pretend that this gold obelisk is somehow a deity it's not happening. They refuse to bow down. So everybody bows down and these three men are standing there. I brought to you the story of my parents in, in Spain when there was that procession and everybody bowed down to the Virgin uh, and they were standing there in the park and everybody was like looking at them. Um, that's what's happening in the story. So if you look at the top of the page, Kol Kobel Dena, right? Everybody has a place? I had my water. I said that I had before. I'm just going to drink a little. Kol Kobel Dena. Bezimna. And consequently, at that time, Kerivu Gubrin Kastain, there were these uh, Chaldeans, right? One of the ethnic groups in Babylonia were the Chaldeans. Ba'achalu. These Chaldeans, they snitched on the Jews, right? Because they saw that everybody was bowing down and they saw that the Jews refused to bow down. So they were excited. They go to Nebuchadnezzar. And I love the word for snitching in Aramaic. In Hebrew, it's called Lashon Hara. So when you speak ill about somebody, an evil, um, the tongue of an evil person, um, but the, 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 the word in Aramaic is va'achalu karsehon. It literally means to cannibalize, to eat the person's flesh, like you would eat a biscuit, right? That's, that's a beautiful word, because that's the purpose of snitching in this type of society. It's to destroy the person about whom you're snitching. Ano, ve'amerin l'inbuchadnesar malka, malka le'alemin chayi. And they immediately, they address the king. They come into the palace. The king invites them. We have something very important. Emergency. We must see the king. And they tell the king, may your majesty live eternally. Ant Malka, Samt Te'ayim. You, O king, you declare, you establish the following law. Yicholenash Yishma that any individual who hears the, the symphony orchestra, right, the various musical instruments, I'm not going to explain the meaning of every instrument, I'm just going to read the pasu, and I will um, uh, ask you to look at the previous class where I explain each one of these instruments. Kal karna, uh, kal karna, mashro kita, katros, katros, it sounds just like guitar, right? You see that? Katros, kitara, right? Okay. Sabecha, uh, pesanterin, besu, Ponya, you see suponeya, it looks like the word symphony, right? The uh, uh, Indo-European languages have certain similarities. Um, 
Be's good, le salam, le salam de Allah. You declared, you set the law that anybody who hears these instruments and with the signal given, they should fall down on the ground and prostrate themselves before this gold obelisk. Didn't you say that, Your Majesty? Wasn't that what you said? And furthermore, you also said, if somebody violates this rule, that he's good, and he doesn't bow down, this person will be thrown into a burning furnace of fire. Very interesting because Abraham Avinu, um, uh, thousands of years before that, also was bur uh, uh, thrown into the pit of fire, and that was also in Babylonia for refusing to bow down to idolatry. So it's very interesting how Nebuchadnezzar apparently understands history well, and he is going to undo what Abraham Avinu did, because what Abraham Avinu did is Abraham in Babylonia refused to accept the dictates of king or tyrant Nimrod, who said, bow down to the idol, and Abraham Avinu said no. And Nimrod threw him into the fire. So Nebuchadnezzar is going to undo that. This was blasphemy, the deities of Babylonia. The fact that Abraham Avinu got away with it. It's not going to happen now. They will be thrown into the fire, but they will be burnt. Your Majesty, getting back to the, uh, these Chaldeans, they're in the palace, they're talking to the Nebuchadnezzar, they're talking and they say, There are these Jews. Uh, you know, so I don't know what, what is this madness with Jews, you know, and it's, it's not just the Western world. Every society has a sickness for Jews. I mean, I, I have to say, I, I, I like Joe Rogan. He has really good shows. I watched many of his shows about archaeology, about different subjects. But the other day, he had this thing. They were talking about Jews, right? The, the Benjamins, right? I don't know. If, does anybody know what the Benjamin means? Why, why is that a derogatory term? Does anybody? Yeah, the $100 bill, 18th century. Ah, that's what it means? I see. Thank you. So, Benjamin. So, it's just kind of funny, like, you know, because there's a certain madness that descends upon people when they talk about Jews. So, Joe Rogan was going at Aha for the Jews. It's all about the money. I, I just thought that was kind of um, ironic hearing a person like Joe Rogan, who, by the way, is really smart. I mean, he is smart, and I, I do like him. I like his content. I like his shows. But hearing a smart, I mean, if he was an idiot, then I wouldn't say anything. Like, but he's a really smart person, a person who has a $200 million contract with Spotify saying how for the Jews, it's all about the money. I mean, that's, that's what's the word, fresh? <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. And, and I just want to, and, and, and if Joe Rogan was here, I'd just like to ask him a following question. He has a lot of friends, right? Very successful friends. Can he find a single friend among his circle of friends who it's not all about the money? Is he doing his shows for free as a charity? Is he doing his comedy shows for free to, as a charity? Do you know anybody who what they do in life is for free as a charity? Who does it not about the money? You want to know who does it not about the money? Jews. We're obligated to give charity, and we give tons and tons and tons of charity. That's why you see so many synagogues built by Jews, so many schools built by Jews, so many hospitals built by Jews, so many medical centers built by Jews, because Jews are actually the one people who do things. They do things for the money. It is. But they also do things not about the money. They do things for sedaqah. It is a solemn obligation for every Jew to give tzedakah. We should be proud about that because they always, they, they say this nonsense. And again, I like Joe Rogan. I, I will continue to watch uh, his content. Hopefully he'll, he'll go back to the correct path. But this madness about Jews. So he says, Itai guvin Yehuda. The Jews! We caught the Jews! Okay. Mabruk to you. I'm sorry, somebody here had a question. No, it's a Jew. Who? A no, I don't think so. No, I mean... Did you ever see the guy? The guy's a, 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 a jiu-jitsu expert, crazy fighter, outdoorsman. Uh, he's definitely, he's definitely, he's many things. A Jew is not one of them. <laughs> All right. Um, so, Itai Guvrin Yehudayin, Timanita Yatamon Ravidat Medina Pavel. There are these Jews, right? When you say Jews, okay. Eyes begin to twitch. And you appointed them, Your Majesty. 
as um, officers in the province of Babylonia. You remember that when Daniel got promoted, uh, Daniel took his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, and he gave them jobs, right? Shadrach, Meshach, Ba'avet, Nego, Kubraya, Ilech, Lasamu, Alach, Malkat, Te'aim. These people did not submit themselves to the law that you declared. They did not bow down. They did not, um, I'm sorry, they did not worship your God. And they did not bow down before the golden obelisk that you made. So these people, we know what they deserve. They deserve death penalty. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. He was very clear. It was very clear. They, they are repeating his words. Um, Nebuchadnezzar uh, uh, did declare that anybody who does not bow down before the obelisk at the appointed time will be thrown into the fire. Um, let's stop for a moment. I just want to point out three things about what every successful dictatorship needs. Okay, because this is this is how you understand the story, and you see it here in the story. Three element to a successful dictatorship. Anyone thinking about, about becoming a dictator should read the book of Daniel because it has it all. Um, uh, when I was young, there was a, a, a cartoon show. It was called Pinky and the Brain. Does that jingle anybody? Am I the only one who watches cartoon when I was young? Nobody watched cartoon. It's Pinky and the Brain. Right? Oh, there. Finally, a brave man admits it, right? So there's Pinky, there's a brain, and brain wants to take over the world. If you want to take over the world, these are the three things you need. Number one, yeah, well, we'll get to that. You need a symbol, a symbol of the state. In the case of the Nazis, it was a swastika. In the case of the communists, it was the hammer and the sickle. In the case of Babylonia here, it's the golden obelisk. This becomes a symbol of the Babylonian empire. I want you to understand, dictatorships like Nazi Germany, they use these types of state symbols to promote a sense of nationalism to promote unity among the citizens and to visually represent the ideologies and values of the state. So getting back to the swastika and against the Nazi Germany, it was not just a symbol of the Nazi party, but it was a symbol that evoked certain feelings of power and strength among the citizens who would look at the swastika and they would feel this sense of superiority, right? So this is state symbols used for propaganda. So, and for Gentiles, everything is visual. Everything is sight, right? They, they judge based upon the visual. By the way, there was one Gentile, famous Gentile, who didn't judge based upon the visual, who actually was influenced apparently by a Jew. And do you know who this Gentile was? This week's Perasha. What's the first, first word of this week's Perasha? Yitro. And what's the first word? Because for the Jews, Jews think not in terms of the visual, they think in terms of linguistics, hearing, auditory. They like to see the passage and the unfolding of things. So they put information together differently than the Gentiles. For the Gentiles, Greek metaphysics about what I see. For the Jew, it's what I hear. So if a person walks into the Knees, and he has an amazing beard and a big hat. I will respect him, but I, I believe in respecting everybody. But I wait to see what he says. And if what he says doesn't conform with the way he looks, I will not judge him based on the way he looks. I will judge him based on what he said. That's the Jewish thinking. Very important. So that's number one. So the first thing you want to start an empire, thinking in the brain, visual symbol of the state. Here it was, the gold obelisk. Number two, threat of violence, threat of violence, very important. We spoke about Nazi German, Germany, um, let's speak about uh, Stalin. He used the threat of violence to control the people by creating a pervasive sense of fear and equally important uncertainty. Stalin employed a secret police. You heard of it, KGB. They weren't the only secret police force in the Soviet Union. They would monitor what people are doing. 
They would detain people who were su uh, suspected of a crime, and they would execute perceived enemies of the state, right? They had the, 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 the forced labor camps known as the gulags, and they would use the gulags to punish people, but of course there would also be executions. So we see how Nebuchadnezzar represents in his mannerisms the elements of a dictator. We said the obelisk, visual image, we said the threat of violence. Anybody who doesn't submit themselves fully to the state will be executed. And the third thing you need in order to have a successful dictatorship is you need the collaboration of the people. People have to be willing to, and Mikey said this before, they need to be willing to snitch on each other. I think one of the great masterpieces of uh, the 20th century is, and I, I, I quote this book a lot because I really think it's a great book, The Gulag Archipelago by uh, Shelzenetsin, right? The Gulag Archipelago, it's a, it, it really is a masterpiece. I think it was recently republished, and I believe the great uh, psychologist uh, Jordan Peterson wrote an introduction to the Gulag um, Archipelago. One, one of the things he talks about, he describes how in the uh, communist regime they relied on collaborators. They're very important because the communists didn't have a lot of resources, right? Uh, because a communism, socialism is a failed system. No, nobody produces, so it, it just collapses. So they don't have the resources to actually police everybody. So they have, for example, in the Gulag, they have what's called Zex. You heard of the Zex? Uh, the Zeks were just regular prisoners who were tasked with keeping order among the prisoners and they were given the power to enforce the rules and punish anybody who they just accused of having broken the rules, right? They could beat the prisoners um, and, um, and, and, and this was, uh, and, 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 and the use of other prisoners to snitch on each other created fear. You never knew who you're talking to you never knew if he's loyal to you, loyal to the prison system, fear. So again, you need collaboration. Another example, and this was, um, in, um, this was in the cities of Moscow and Leningrad. There, was a, there were a lot of intellectuals there. And the intellectuals, because they were intellectuals and they were, you know, they, apparently they were intelligent, they didn't fully buy into the communist ideas of Stalin, of Lenin before him. So they used to have informers, everyday citizens who were working for the government to report on the activities of their friends and neighbors, right? So this is a very important part of every dictatorship is you need people among the population to snitch on other people in the population like that people are terrified and people know to stay in order. Nobody will speak because they don't know who they're speaking to and who is listening. So that's what Nebuchadnezzar did. You see how Nebuchadnezzar really, he knew what he was doing. These guys, Yemach uh, Shemo, the head of Germany, uh, uh, Mussolini, uh, who was in Japan, uh, Togo, um, you know, we said Stalin, probably uh, Mao Tse Song from China, another, wow, these people are such low lives. I just like, uh, anyway, they, they, were, they were just following Nebuchadnezzar's playbook. Nebuchadnezzar is the one who, who, who established the playbook on how to be a successful dictator, and they were just uh, uh, following that. So it's all here. Let's continue. Bedai. Yes. Yeah. Please. I'm sorry, could you repeat yourself? Yeah. Yeah. And that was the way it was. They just punished people who had property. And then there was a, a, a law that everybody has to be equal and everybody has to divide it. Right. And people like that idea. So they told them if anybody knows, whoever doesn't share yeah. what they have, please, please come and talk to me. Snitch on a uh, snitch. Right. Right, right. That's, what, that's how they 
That's, that was very common for family members. Yeah, family members would snitch on each other. That was very common. Right, and that's and that's uh, and by the way, it's a great point, and that's a subject for another class that I actually wrote about in one of my articles because they were always interested in the destruction of the family. Which, by the way, we see one of the things that's happening now in America though is that they want to destroy every family value, and they try to create this illusion that oh, you know, this is that, and that is you know, black is white, and, and right is left, and up is down, and and, they, and and they're actively trying to destroy. They got that for the communists, by the way. The communists wrote about this very extensively, and, and also. The sexual perversion of the masses is an explicit um, uh, goal of the communists in, in Russia and the Soviet Union. So they're, they're actually, I mean, the people ruling America now are just um, Talmidim of, um, of Stalin and Lenin, uh, unfortunately. Uh, let's continue. Bevain Nebuchadnezzar. And then, and I remember Nebuchadnezzar is hearing this. And keep in mind, he really wanted the antidote to the nightmare to work, right? So he's hearing that these three people refused to bow down. So Bedain, Nebuchadnezzar, Bigraz, he got angry. The Hamani became hot. Amar, Lehaiteye, Le Shadrach, Meshach, Vavednego. Bring them to me. Bedain, Kubraya, Lech, Etayu, Konamalka, and they brought. These three Jews before the king. Nebuchadnezzar addressed these three people and he told them, Hasta Shadrach Meshach Ba'aved Nego Le'ela. I should have brought my glasses. Le'ela Hai La Itechon Palechin. Is it true that you refused to worship my God? And that you refuse to bow down before the golden obelisk? Is, is that correct? Explain yourselves. Right? Um, and and, and it's, it's, it's so interesting uh, how you have your dictator, and the dictator is talking about religion. Are you, not, are you not following my religion? Are you not bowing before my God? And, and again, you have to understand that in Gentile societies, religion and politics were two sides of the same coin. Um, hey, by the way, there is only one society, one nation, where religion and politics were separated from each other. Do you know which society this was? Well, actually, America had this idea of separation of church and state, and now it's becoming less so. But, so, but where did America get it? Uh, let's talk about antiquity. A Judaism, the Torah. In the Torah, you have a clear separation. You have the king, he's one person. You have the Kohen Gadol, he's a religious figure, so the king represents the political. The Kohen Gadol represents the theological, and then you have the... Uh, Sanhedrin, the, the court system. So complete separation of powers. Um, but, but this isn't the way it was in Gentile societies. Um, Henry VIII of England, early 16th century, what did he do? He broke away from the Catholic Church, declared himself the head of the Church of England. And um, he dissolved the monasteries, he seized the wealth and power of the Church, he imposed strict fines and punishments on those who refused to recognize his authority over the church, right? So here's a, here's a great example of King Henry VIII establishing him. Okay, on the one hand, he's the king of England. On the other hand, he is the supreme religious figure of England. By the way, today in England, you know that the king and the queen are the head of the church of England, right? You all know that, right? I'm not giving anybody a chidush by saying that. And the king and the queen, Formally, although today they don't, uh, they don't really exercise their political power, but at least formally and in the Constitution of England, they have what's called royal assent. The royal assent basically means that the monarch, uh, it's a formal procedure, and again, it's, it's only a formality because I think since the 18th century, the king and the queen stopped exercising their political authority, but royal assent is one of the final, process, uh, final stages in the process of passing legislation in England, which is to say that technically speaking, the king and the queen have the right to um, give a thumbs down and say, no, we don't agree to this, uh, to this legislation. So interesting how you still have vestiges of the ancient Western world today in England. I'm, probably, I'm not against the monarchy in England, so nobody, I hope them don't come off as being against the monarchy, but I'm just pointing out that the monarchy represents the supreme religious authority and the monarchy represents the supreme political authority. Really amazing. That comes from antiquity. Why, 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 look, at, uh, why look at Catholicism? So we, we brought some examples, we brought Catholicism, um, or in this case, uh, King Henry VIII of England, he abolished Catholicism. But there's also um, 
in Islam, the, the Khalif. The Khalif, what is the Khalif? He is the supreme, um, uh, the head of the Islamic uh, political and religious um, authority. So the, 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 the supreme authority in Islam, the supreme political authority, the supreme religious authority is the Khalif. So the idea of the Caliphate is that we're gonna have a political leader who is also gonna be the supreme religious leader, right? So you see how in all, in ancient society, this is ubiquitous. I mean, this all, the Kohen Gadol, of, of the, the high priest of any particular religion was also the king of that particular nation. So what Nebuchadnezzar is doing here is just, uh, you know, um, very common, right? By the way, in Judaism, there was a time where the king was also the Kohen Gadol in the days of the Maccabees, and that was against the Halakha, and the Hachamim were very angry at that. And eventually the Maccabees degenerated in a terrible way. That was not supposed to be the case, meaning the Maccabees should never have stayed as king. That was against Judaism, and uh, the final disintegration of the, of the Maccabee uh, kingdom was almost embarrassing. I mean, what happened to them was just, it was, it was a, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a stain on our history. Um, and, and by the way, today, and, and, and today we have wokeness. I mean, who promotes wokeness? This is a new religion, wokeness. Right, who promotes it? It's a political establishment that's promoting the religion of wokeness. Um, people who go against wokeness, uh, we mentioned Dr. Jordan Peterson, one of the greatest psychologists perhaps alive today, one of the greatest intellectuals alive today. I mean, just watch him de debate anybody, and, and it's like, it's, it's, it's really kind of funny to watch because he's so much smarter than almost everybody else. And uh, they're, they're, they, they, they want to have, he have re-education for Jordan Peterson because he is against woke values. Re-education, what, what does that remind you of? When you think of re-education, it reminds you of the Soviet Union, dark times, you have to re-educate the person because he doesn't believe in the state doctrines or the state dogma. It's unbelievable. So you see that you know, even in the modern world, we still have this idea of religion called wokeness being promoted by the political establishment and you must accept this religion. Do not speak against it because if you do, we will cancel you. Jordan Peterson, great example. So Judaism was the only place where this nonsense did not happen. Continuing. Can you recognize who you're talking to? Who? Uh, yes. Can you remember the one when I cut off the other job? Correct. Correct. Ke'an. And Nebuchadnezzar now is continuing to talk to these three young men, and he says the following. And now, hen itechom atidin if you are now willing to have a do-over. We're going to give you a do-over, okay? What's a do-over going to be? I want everybody to come back. I want to uh, have the symphony playing the music. I want the signal to be given. If you're willing, to submit yourself and to pray before the Abu Dazara, great, wonderful. He wants them to bow down. They are not to schedule, but if you're not willing to do it, ba sha'ata titremon lero atunura yakidita. Immediately you will be thrown into the burning furnace. Umanu <laughs> ela. Uh, let's be real. Miracles? Somebody's going to save you? I'm, I'm going I'm to throw you into the fire. You will be thrown into the fire. Who, who's going to save you? Okay. Again, he really wants them to bow down. He doesn't want to throw them into the fire. Because don't forget the nightmare. The nightmare was a small stone representing Am Yisrael that refuses to accept the idol and therefore attacks the idol. So what's happening here? The small stone is represented by these people and they publicly refuse to accept the idol. They're attacking the idol. Not only is this ceremony um, a cure for the dream, an antidote for the dream, this ceremony is actually the realization of the dream. Because if these three people don't bow down, the idol is destroyed. 
the empire will disintegrate. He gets it. So he really wants them to bow down. All right. And who's going to save you? Who's going to save you? Let's be real. Miracles, okay. We read about miracles in storybooks. Um, so now, finally, they get a chance to speak, and they tell the king as follows. Anybody see anything wrong here? He didn't hear you. <laughs> they didn't refer to him as your majesty. You know, nothing. Nebuchadnezzar, they call him by his name, right? Yo, George, it's not the president, it's not your majesty, it's not the king. Man, these guys, they have a lot of guts. <laughs> they have a lot, I mean, really. And they say the most intelligent thing. We have no interest whatsoever in answering what you just said. I just love this. You know, people love arguing with each other. I, 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 I have a friend of mine who just went to Israel. He has some left-wing, liberal, secular relatives. Every time he goes there, they, they start arguing about this, about Netanyahu, about, about the politics, about the yes giving land, no giving. It's, it's all stupidity. What, what, like, the argument is futile. It's useless. There is no point in arguing with people. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, I have a great, uh, a great fidush, a great insight. Mental illness is an illness. You can't argue with people who are mentally ill. Meaning, people who accept degenerate, ludicrous values are sick. So what are you arguing about? What is the point? Are you going to change their mind? Are you going to tell them, really, it's not a good idea to mutilate children. It's not a good idea. They, they, they can't. They can't drive cars, right? They can't buy alcohol, but they can decide to mutilate themselves, right? That's not a good idea. I mean, does, is that gonna, does that change anybody's mind? No, of course not, because it's mental illness, right? So what they're saying is the smartest thing. We're not going to waste our time arguing. They're going to say, Nebuchadnezzar, it's an idol. It's really not alive. You think the spirit of the God came? No, the spirit of the God. What are you wasting your time? So they say, just, you know, it'll be easier to be burnt in the fire than to engage you in this discussion. Throw us in the fire. We don't want to suffer by having this argument with this crazy idolater, right? That's what they're saying. We don't want to discuss it with you. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Any time, Elahana, the Amachna Falechim, Yahil Leshe Zavutana. But we do want to say one thing. The God that we worship, he, he could save us from this fire. He, 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 if he wants to, he could save us from the fire. And he can also save us from you. You want to hit us, you want to hurt us, you want to torture us. <laughs> if God wants to, he'll save us. That's his business. Uh, but you don't scare us. I'm sorry, behenla. Now, it could be that God decides not to save us. That, that's his business, right? But, but it doesn't, it's besides the point. Meaning, whether God saves us from you, doesn't save us from you, that's not the point. We are not going to do Avodah Zara. End of story, right? We're not going to bow down before your gold idol. It's not happening. So you want to throw us in, spare us, don't show us another segment of CNN or whatever, you know, arguing about politics. And just throw us in the fire, end it, make it less cruel, right? No, no, no cruelty, no torture. <laughs> They're dying. Uh, but before we continue, any questions? I mean, I, I didn't really give a chance for questions. They're <laughs> And now Nebuchadnezzar was filled with rage. Muslim and pohi ishtani. And his facial contours begin to change. Because usually when you're like a diplomat, you know how to control yourself and you know, you know how to be very um, smooth and suave. And, and he, lost, he lost it. He lost his cool. His face was changing. 
al chadraf meshaf ba'abed nego, with respect to these three Jews, Aneve Amar, and he now says the following, Lemeze le'atuna, hachiva al dihaze lemazyeh. Immediately, I want you to add fuel to the fire seven times more than you're supposed to add. So usually I don't have like, I don't know, 100 pounds of coal or, or, or wood or whatever. I want you to put the, the, the maximum, just for example, put 700 pounds. I want this fire to be the biggest fire ever. He is scared that if he throws him into the fire, it's going to repeat, repeat what Abraham Avinu did. He doesn't want that to happen. He wants the fire to be so strong that it just burns anything instantaneously, no Questions asked. He is desperate. He is desperate because this is the last chance to stop that nightmare from taking place. He brought these powerful henchmen from his army, right? Really big guys. Um, tie them up. He doesn't want them escaping from the fire, right? I want you tying up these three Jews, right? And then after you tie them up, I want you to throw them in the fire. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was angry, and he's calling these guys, and, and you know, these dictators are crazy. Uh, one of the problems that happening in China, for example, today is that um, um, Xi, is not getting information from the generals of his army. The reason he's not getting information from the generals of his army is if somebody says the wrong thing to Xi, he kills them, right? So, so, so what's happening now is there is sort of um, a, a situation where the person ruling the country doesn't know what's happening because people are afraid. So when Putin went to visit Xi and, um, and Putin told uh, Xi, you know, I'm not going to, you know, I am not going to, you know, that I'm not just gonna invade Ukraine. That's not something that I plan on doing. That's just incorrect. And you see the general in the background in the video, and he's like, you know, the facial expressions show that he knows that Putin is lying to Xi, but nobody's going to say anything that Xi doesn't want to hear. So what's happening here? Let me explain to you. He wants to tie up these people, and he wants them thrown into the fire immediately without any delay. There's one problem. Nobody has rope. <laughs> I know it sounds funny. So what do they do? What do these people do? They take the clothing that these people are wearing and they use the clothing as rope because, again, they're not going to tell the king, Your Majesty, okay, no problem, we have to go to the uh, hardware store, Ace's hardware store, get some rope. They don't have rope, right? So they take off their clothing, they tie them with their hats, with their uh, tunics, with, with their belts. <laughs> they, so, so I wanted to explain why that's happening. So, so these people are completely tied up, unable to move, and they're thrown, they're literally catapulted um, um, into, the, uh, into the fire. They're catapulted into the fire. What happens? Kol kovel dena. Because the king was in such a rush to, um, to have these people burn. People were afraid of him. Again, think President Xi of, of China. People were afraid of him. What happened is, and they put so much fuel in the fire. There was a flame of fire that came out and completely burned those people who catapulted Hananiah um, Misheva uh, Azariah into the fire. So those people were burned because the fire was way too big and there was no way to catapult the people. I mean, uh, well, there was a, you catapult the people. The problem is where you're standing now, the fire is out of control. It's way larger than it's supposed to be and it just literally, a flame just shot out and burned them alive. So they were burned. So Hananiah Misheva Azariah now are inside the furnace and these guys who threw them that's it, halas. Um, they're, they're, they're gone, right? Um, the Kubraya ilech telatehon, these three men, Shadraf, Meshach, Abed Nego, Nefalu, Lero Atun Nuraya Kita Mechapetin, they literally fell into the fire completely um, bound, unable to move. 
and that's how they're thrown into the fire. What happens? Edain, Nebuchadnezzar Malka, Tevaha, Bekan Behit Behala. Now, at this point in time, Nebuchadnezzar was sitting down. He wanted to enjoy this scene, right? So he was sitting down, and there was people sitting down, and they didn't stay. They, they, they were going to enjoy watching the Jews burn. By the way, I, I, I know you think I'm saying that in jest, but uh, for example, in the, in the days of the Inquisition, when they would find Jews who were uh, people, uh, Jews who pretended to be um, Christian but were actually Jews, when they would catch these people, they would have... Um, uh, ceremonies where people would be invited from all over to watch the uh, to watch the Jews burning. Right? So, so it, this was very common in the Inquisition, right? And thousands of people would come to the to see the burning of the Jews. Uh, so I, I know it sounds like I'm saying it in jest. I'm not. These people are sick people, right? Uh, unfortunately, um, my father has a book by Moïse Franco. Moïse Franco was a uh, he was a French teacher in the Alliance in the uh, end of the 19th century, and he wrote a book about the um, he wrote a book about the Ottoman Empire, and he collected uh, different eyewitness reports. And in the book, he brings an eyewitness report, and, and, and here's the story. Uh, the story involved the Queen of Austria, who told it to the person. So this is like kind of a first-hand story. The Queen of Austria relates that she went to see the burning of some Jews um, in, 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 in one of the Inquisition fires, and um, there was a 17-year-old girl, Jew, a 17-year-old Jewish girl, right? Um, and she sees the Queen of Austria, and this girl tells the Queen of Austria, aren't you embarrassed of yourself? So this, this, this is what you do with your time? You're, you're, you're going to see people being burnt alive? Um, and apparently the Queen was um, somehow moved or impressed by this girl, and she related it to this person. So it was, it was common for people uh, to, to, you know, to uh, enjoy themselves uh, in this way. Uh, by the way, a lot of the TV shows, a lot of the movies, I mean, they're sick, depraved, they're, they're simply disgusting. I'm sorry to say it, I mean, there's a certain sickness in our society where we gratify ourselves by seeing the horrible scenes of violence, I, you know, re really sick. And, 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 and I say it's really sick because it just, it's just a vestige of a disease in humanity, and the fact that the vestige is there doesn't uh, bode well for us as a, as, as a species. Yeah. Anyway. Oh, so what happens? So Nebuchadnezzar is sitting there, he wants to enjoy himself, and suddenly he jumps up in fear. And he tells, um, uh, uh, the, the, the people next to him, he had like some government officials next to him. Didn't we throw three people who were tied up into the fire. Is, isn't that what just happened? Like, what, what did I, did I miss something? Anayim ve'amirim, the Malka, they said, Your Majesty, Yasiva Malka, yes, this is true. Ane ve'ama, ha'anach hazeh gubrin arba'a, but I'm, I see four people, shirayin, and shirayin, they're free, they're not bound up, because the people who are bound up, they couldn't move, these people are free. Mahalechim, and they're walking. Bego nura, they're walking in the fire. Vahava la ita behon, and they're not injured. Vereve de rebi aa deme lebat elahin, and the fourth person, he looks like some sort of angelic deity or something. So, of course, we know that was the Malach um, who was sent there to save them, and, uh, but, but he sees it as some deity or something. He doesn't know what it is. And the understands what's happening. And unlike Paro, who um, just uh, refuses to get the message for one reason or the other, I understand that. But Paro just refuses to get the message, and until the last moment, he just keeps coming after the Jews, and he keeps getting punched, and you know, at some point in time, just you know, go down for the count and and end the boxing match. Why do you keep standing up and getting beaten? Well, that was Paro. Nebuchadnezzar is not going to repeat the mistake of Paro. Nebuchadnezzar understands what's happening here, and he's not going to, he is not going to confront God directly. So when he sees this, Nebuchadnezzar, Bedain, Kereb, Nebuchadnezzar, Litra, Atu, Atun, Nura, Yakitita, Nebuchadnezzar approaches the entrance to the fire 
to the to the furnace. Aneve Amav, and he says the following: Shadrach, Mr. Shadrach, Meshach, Mr. Meshach, the Aved Nego, Mr. Aved Nego, Avlohi di Elaha Ilaa. You are truly the servants of the Almighty God. Huku, get out of the furnace. Veto, and come to me. Vetain, Napekin, Shadrach, Meshach, Vavet, Negom, Ingonula. And they, accordingly, they leave the furnace and they come towards Nebuchadnezzar. Now, just remember, this is all done publicly because, as I said, the public burning of Jews was always done with a great crowd of people who wanted to come and see it. So there was a huge crowd of people. Remember, everybody was there to bow down to the idol. And um, uh, right, all the government ministers, the magistrates, the judges, the police officers, the heads of the army, right, the, the, the provincial governors, right. So they were all there, and they're all seeing this. They all see that they're completely untouched by the fire. And the hair on their heads wasn't burned. And if anybody, God forbid, but if anybody was close to a fire or some, you know, something of that nature, the first thing to burn is the hair. You actually smell it. Um, their clothing was untouched. There was no smell of burning because when you, even when you do a barbecue, you know, you do a Michigan barbecue, sometimes the smell of the barbecue with the smoke comes on you and you smell from the smoke. There's nothing there. Completely protected. And I see that we're close to the end. Um, so let's read the last passage. He makes a special prayer to the God of these three Jews. Look how this God sent his angel. And this God rescued his servants. These servants of God, they had bitachon, they had um the word in English, bitachon. Faith. Faith in God, that's right. Umilat um, Malka Shaniv, and they refuse to follow my commandments. <laughs> look, look what he says again. He is not going to repeat the mistake of Paro, right? He's not going to repeat that mistake. Hey, they didn't follow my commandments, I know. Vihavu Reshmehon, Dilaif Lechun, Vilayz Gedu Lechol Ela Lehen, Lahen, Le Lahahon. Right? Um, and they were willing to allow themselves to be killed and so as not to bow down before Abu Dazara. He is in awe of these people. He is in awe of what just happened. But now is the end. It is 9.30. And as you know, I don't like going into overtime, but we're almost finished. And next week, Belina, that we will finish. But for now, if there's any remaining questions, if there's anything unclear, I mean, I'm going to take the questions down. But don't be embarrassed. Uh, Gabriel. Yes, any other questions? No. Ladies, ah, yes. So in Iran, uh, also there will be a distinction in religion. Where? In Iran. Oh, in, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's, uh, there are, there, there, we, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, dictatorship is common even nowadays. Yeah, that is correct. Um, you know, but okay, what, what are we going to do? Pray for the messianic era. Um, and uh, pray really hard because we could uh, definitely use some redemption. Rabbi Hanania, Ben Akashia Omer, Nasa Hakadosh Baruchu, Lezakot et Israel, Lefi Chachir Balahim